Hello, has anyone seen my dog? Laika, where are you Laika? On this day in November of 1957, only a month after the launch of Sputnik 1, a dog named Laika was about to become a first animal to orbit the Earth. She was a stray dog picked up from the Moscow streets just over a week before the launch and within that week would become the world's first astronaut. Little did Laika know that this was going to be a suicide mission. Welcome to What The Math. Welcome to episode 2 of the History of Space Flight with Kerbal Space Program. And in this video we're going to be talking about the second mission to orbit the planet, this time with an animal inside. Now this is of course referring to the dog that went to space and her name was Laika. This was a mission by the Soviets and this was uh, only a month after the launch of Sputnik 1, which is this sphere right here. But now this time they decided to make the mission a little bit more complex. They've attached uh, a module right here on the bottom and this is the actual picture of what it looks like where inside of which they had a doggy and this doggy was really really tiny it was a mutt it didn't really um, have any owners because it was a stray dog and it was to be killed in space yes that's right it was the first animal to orbit but also the first animal to die in space and this particular satellite was a little bit more complex than the original Sputnik because um, first of all it had a larger battery that was supposed to last much longer and it also had two particular um, scientific devices which unfortunately we do not have in Kerbal Space Program. I guess the closest one to, uh, to that would be if I were to attach a... Um, one of these uh, uh, gravioli detectors, but unfortunately this is just not going to do it for us. But what this particular satellite had, it had a Geiger sensor to detect radiation, but also a photometric sensor to detect various high uh, energy rays like X-rays, gamma rays and so on. Um, and because of those sensors, it actually had some really cool scientific discoveries. Specifically, it was responsible for discovering Van Allen's belt. But we'll talk about this near the end of the video because let's not rush into things. So let's actually just launch this. And just like Sputnik 1, we're going to be using the R7 ICBM. This was the Sergei Korolev's rocket, his invention, his beauty. And it has four really powerful boosters. It has a central stage that will be propelling us to the orbit. And of course, we have uh, fairings on top to protect everything. Now, here's the thing. Uh, because this is going to be, or this was an automated launch, we're going to be using KOS to launch this for us. So I've rewritten some of my old programs and hopefully KOS will launch us into the correct orbit. The orbit is supposed to be, uh, in real life at least, it was 212 kilometers periapsis, 1660 kilometers apoapsis. I've converted this to Kerbal terms and this should be approximately 70 kilometers periapsis and something around 500 kilometers apoapsis and uh, we're going to be going uh, in a 65 degree orbit as well, or 65 degree inclination that is. So this was November 3rd, 1957. It was a pretty cold day and everyone was really excited about this. Um, and so let's start our KOS. We're going to copy the script called Sputnik. And now we're going to run it and it should take us to space. Now it's obviously not perfect. I actually haven't really modified this too much, but you know what? It works and it flies and it makes things really fun. All right, so it looks like Sputnik 2 is ready for launch. I think Laika is pretty excited about the situation. Actually, I'm pretty sure she's probably terrified and probably already peed herself. Anyway, so let's start our countdown. And three, two, one. Get ready, comrade dog. Here we go. And all of this will be absolutely automated. I'm, I'm gonna uh, open up this window a little bit larger just so you can see what's going on and possibly close this as well so it doesn't interfere with our window. Uh, okay. So it starts pitching almost right away because I decided to initiate um, a gravity turn as soon as fast as possible. Even though it wasn't really that efficient, it kind of looked it made it look a little bit cooler that way. So here we go, and we're going to be observing uh, the rocket as it sort of uh, goes into space and goes into orbit. And as KOS decides to do some calculations for us that. I don't want to do it myself. So this was a more realistic approach because um, a lot of the rockets, a lot of the earlier Soviet rockets were all launched automatically. All of them had 
some sort of a guidance system. Almost none of them had uh, manual control, including the one that carried Gagarin. Gagarin did not fly the rocket, uh, it was actually flown for him with autopilot. Now this mission had two purposes, one of them was obviously to send a living being into orbit, but the other mission that it had was to use its um, Geiger sensor and also its photometric sensors to try to detect all kinds of radiation and all kinds of uh, magnetic fields um, up in the atmosphere. So here comes the separation and we start our second stage. This was very very clean, nothing got destroyed. And at this point what my KOS is supposed to do is wait until um, apoapsis of about 70 kilometers, then stop and wait for circularization. Uh, while we do it, while it's doing that, while we're waiting for it to do that, let's talk a little bit more about the mission. So, the main difference between Sputnik 1 and Sputnik 2 rockets was that, uh, unlike Sputnik 1's, uh, this rocket didn't actually have a separation stage right here. So, this whole thing is essentially the last stage. Uh, the only thing that was supposed to happen on this mission is it was supposed to open its fairings and expose the capsule, um, but the actual Sputnik 2 was essentially this whole rocket. Uh, it didn't have a uh, decoupler because uh, Soviets realized that it wasn't really needed for this type of a mission, and because they didn't expect to get Laika back, uh, like I said, it was a suicide mission from the beginning, they didn't really think it, would be, it was important for it to separate like Sputnik 1 did. Now, unfortunately for the Soviets, something went wrong and the actual fairings got locked inside and so they didn't actually even open. And this is one of the reasons why Laika died a lot more miserably and a lot faster than it would have died otherwise. But let's not talk about this just yet, because it's a very sad story actually. Now, one thing that most people don't realize is that Laika was not the first dog to uh, fly a rocket. As a matter of fact, it wasn't even the first in space. Um, it was the first to orbit Earth. It was the first dog to orbit Earth, but it was definitely not the first to reach space or to fly a rocket. The first dog to actually fly a rocket, and there were two of them, uh, their name were uh, Desik and Tsugan. Um, here's actually the picture of all of the space dogs from the Soviet Union, and these are in order, so you can see the first uh, the first two were Desik and Zigan, and Laika was actually number 15. So Laika was dog number 15 in, um, you know, flying rockets. And all of these dogs, interestingly, were um, actually uh, stray dogs. And all of them were really tiny, all of them were mutts. Now, there is there's two reasons for why only mutts were chosen and why only stray dogs were chosen. According to the Soviets, stray dogs were very, very calm and had really good attitude compared to uh, compared to d dogs that were raised at home. And they were also a lot more tough and were used to har harsher conditions because they grew up on the streets. So that's that's one of the reasons. And also because they were mutts, their temper temperament was much much nicer than uh, than a dog that was purebred. So they didn't really choose any purebreds because, according to Soviets, purebreds were just you know they weren't really nice dogs. They were not as calm. They were they would get upset really quickly, and they were also more difficult to train. Um, another fact about these dogs, and here comes our execution of the burning from. Uh, Apoapsis of 75, so hopefully we'll reach 50 something kilometers. It says, Boosters are out, Comrade Dog, attempting to stage, um, waiting for cir circularization orbit or circularization burn. And here we go, and look at that 560 kilometers apoapsis and 75 kilometers periapsis. This is almost perfect, almost exactly like it was in real life. It says, Laika is now in orbit, comrade. Uh oh, something is wrong, comrade. Dot, dot, dot. Comrade, we have a hot dog. Program ended. Now, this is my attempt at bad humor, but basically this is what happened. So, these fairings never opened up, and because of that, the heat started to build up inside inside the capsule where Laika was, and the poor doggy died of heat and exhaustion after a few hours. It was actually supposed to stay in space for several weeks. It was supposed to be orbiting around just like this, uh, for several weeks, um, actually almost a, a month, I believe, and this whole time it, um, it was supposed to report back uh, all kinds of telemetry, not the dog itself, but the capsule was supposed to report back telemet telemetry and also all kinds of findings, and it was quite successful at doing that, but the thing is, it was also supposed to report all kinds of um, live data from the, uh, from the poor doggy for at least a week, they actually expected it to survive for a week, and this is exactly what the report to the media, but reality 
uh, is that it, that's not what happened. In 2002, uh, the Russia actually disclosed uh, the true information, and because it was actually secret for 45 years. And this, the, the, the reality was that uh, the poor doggy died after a few hours. It died in extreme heat. Uh, the temperatures got to over 40 degrees Celsius, and it just died of de dehydration and also heat exhaustion. Now, uh, so this is what the Sputnik 2 looked like, even though it was supposed to look like this. It was supposed to have these fairings uh, on the... Uh, basically, they were supposed to deploy, they were supposed to disappear, and then we were supposed to have uh, our... Uh, Sputnik 1 on top, and then the Leica capsule right here, and that was supposed to be enough for it not to overheat. Anyway, let's not talk about the sad things anymore, and talk more about the things that we managed to accomplish. So, uh, one of the things that I mentioned was that, uh, because of the Geiger counter and the photo, uh, photovoltaic sensor, we were able to detect the Van Allen's belt. And the thing is, here's what happened. Uh, when the, the uh, Valen Allen's belts were detected, and I'm, talk I'm talking about the radiation belt right around our planet, when it was detected, uh, the Sputnik 2 was actually passing by Australia. And the signal that it sent was intercept intercepted by an Australian professor uh, whose name was Harry Messel. And he intercepted the signal and he refused to share it with the Soviets. And essentially for years, or at least several months, they just couldn't agree on what to do with the signal because they couldn't decipher it, it was all encoded, and the Soviets couldn't get the signal. And because of that, Van Allen's ballots were not discovered officially until later on, until a US mission, where a professor, Van Allen, that's what the ballots are actually named after, uh, discovered them using the American satellite. So, for all we know, the, uh, Van Allen's belts could have actually been called Leica belts or Messer, Messel belts because of the uh, Australian professor who actually had the signal information. Now, Soviets actually had a lot of dogs in space. There were a total of 57 different dogs in space in about 20 year period between 51 and, and 67. And uh, only a few of these dogs died. Leica was actually one of the bigger profile dogs that ended up not surviving. But uh, the mission was never meant to return to, uh, to Earth, so th they kind of knew that uh, Leica was going to die. And it's really interesting because if you look at the Soviet space dogs right here, you'll notice that all of them are actually female. Uh, the, their names end with Ka, that's a female name, uh, and that's because um, all of the dogs were female, and be they were female for only one reason. Well, actually, two reasons. One of them was they were supposed to be nicer, but the main reason was because the uh, the spacesuit for dogs was only meant for female dogs. The waste disposal inside the suit was only meant for female dogs. It just didn't apply to male dogs. So if a male dog went, went uh, was going to pee inside the suit, it would most likely be very very uncomfortable and possibly even uh, cause some sort of uh, electrical shortcut because the urine would not be collected, but for female dogs it was really easy to collect, so that's why only females were picked. Another interesting thing that dogs in space discovered is that after you've been to space for a while, it's really hard to poop. In other words, most of the dogs who went to space came back really constipated. And this is because of zero gravity and because the food we eat on Earth and the foods that, that were being fed to dogs in space didn't really... Um, didn't process well. So. Uh, because of these findings, we now know that, first of all, food has to be more jelly-like, so a lot of the um, modern astronauts use jelly-like food. And the other thing is that it has to be really, really high in fiber, because otherwise you'll be constipated after being in space. Now, as I mentioned before, the first dog in space, whose name was Dazik, and also Tsigan, uh, these two dogs uh, were actually together on the same rocket. They were the same to travel in a rocket, and this was in 1951. This was actually six years before Laika. And uh, they traveled to an altitude of 110 kilometers and came back fine. They actually came, ba came back alive. Only a few dogs, um, of all of these dogs you see uh, on the list of Soviet space dogs, actually died. Only very few of them. But there's actually another fun fact about one of the space dogs uh, that was supposed to go on a mission as well. Uh, the dog's name was Smilaya, which in Russian means brave or courageous. And ironically, that the poor doggy ran away right before launch to only be discovered a day after. So it actually it got scared, ran away. Uh, but they did discover it and they actually still put it on the rocket the day after and it still got to go to space. 
And the last fun fact about dogs in space is that uh, two of the more popular and most famous dogs in space are Belka and Strelka. Here's their picture. Now, uh, their names mean squirrel and arrow. And these two dogs were the first living creatures to go to orbit and then came back alive. So they were on a mission called Sputnik 5. Uh, very similar to this rocket, actually. Very, very similar. Just a little bit uh, different design in terms of return capsule. And they went to space along with a gray rabbit, 42 mice, and two rats. Also, there were some flies and uh, plants and fungi. Essentially, it was like a zoo. It was a zoo in space, but it was Strelka and Belka that became the most famous dogs in Soviet Union because they came back uh, and basically uh, returned alive. So this was the first orbital success story. And it was obviously also full of discoveries because we now knew that life can easily survive in space and this mission was actually pretty amazing as well. Anyway, so that's basically the nutshell of Sputnik 2 mission and all the cool facts about it. And look at that, it looks like we had a stowaway on our ship. Jebdai Kerman just happened to have been inside the capsule all this time. And he's gonna go ahead and try to save Laika, resuscitate Laika and give her a breath of life. And then hopefully make it return back to Earth. Anyway guys, thank you so much for watching. This has been What The Math with episode 2 of History of Space Flight. All about Sputnik 2 and the Soviet space dogs. Hopefully you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please subscribe and check out some of the other Kerbal Space Program videos that I've posted. Here is the link for them. And don't forget that we also have Twitch on Saturdays, when we're going to be doing all kinds of madness in Kerbal Space Program together. Thank you so much guys for watching and for liking this video. Please post a comment about what you think about this mission, and if you think it was a success. Game you later, bye bye.